you ask for suggested donation at the door. And if you've not already done so, we've conveniently placed a donation box in the doorway for you to trip when you walk by. <laughs> um, we will have a question, uh, a question and answer period after our speaker, and we have some wine here, so if you'd like to have a glass afterwards. I am particularly excited about tonight's speaker because I, too, was once a woman living and working in Hollywood. Um, our speaker, Maria Geis, is a fairly recent new full-time resident of Stonington, although she tells me her husband's family has been here for generations and they have spent many vacations here up until recently. Um, she has been at the forefront of the movement fighting for gender equity in Hollywood. And she's going to share with us tonight some of her story and some pretty staggering statistics. We are so thrilled that she's here tonight because she's debuting this particular presentation here at La Grua. So let's please give her a very warm welcome. Maria Gross. Hi. <clears throat> it's so great to be here. It really is a privilege. And um, I really am grateful to La Grua for having me and um, giving me this opportunity to talk about what I've been through. So thank you for having me and um, thank you all for coming to listen to what may seem like a trivial issue when so much is at stake in our country, in our world right now. Let me first say that over the past few years I've given uh, dozens and dozens of interviews, which I love to do, but um, <clears throat> I've only given a, a one talk, <laughs> so I'm going to refer to my notes uh, quite a bit here in order to tell you as concisely as possible uh, what I did in Hollywood over the past five years and how I got this very um, exciting federal investigation into discrimination against women directors going. Then I'll open it up to questions, and uh, which is a much better way for me to explain what we're doing going forward and um, why I think that this is so important. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here we go. So I was in my, I, when I was in my 20s, I had a big dream of becoming a filmmaker. Uh, like so many other young people, I headed out to Hollywood and became part of the Hollywood gold rush culture, uh, chasing my dream. I'm a pretty determined person, and I pursued that dream relentlessly for more than two decades. I had some initial success, but by 2011, I had to admit that I had failed. I was unemployed, and I was frustrated, and I was really angry. Then cut to today, five years later, I'm now the subject, a subject, in five feature-length documentary films. Fortune magazine wrote about my journey in its most powerful women's section. In the New York Times, Manola Dargas called my work a veritable crusade. And the Hollywood Reporter, in The Hollywood Reporter, I was referred to as a troublemaker, which I <laughs> considered to be a great compliment. <laughs> my picture appeared on the front page of the Los Angeles Times, uh, Meet the Woman Who Started the EEOC Investigation into Sexism in Hollywood. Stanford University awarded me the 2016 Equity Award in Palo Alto last February. And this September, I've been invited to speak at the Alturas Institute Conversations with Exceptional Women. Sometimes I ask myself, how did this all happen? So I had dreamed of becoming a director since I was a teenager. I was over the moon when after graduating from Wellesley College, UCLA accepted me into their graduate directing program. That was in 1989. And thanks to Title IX, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title IX, which ensures uh, equal opportunity in education and sports, half my class was men and half my class was women. It was gender equal. I guess I should have seen trouble ahead there was only one part-time female uh, directing professor, and men had directed almost 100% of the movies that we studied. In all Hollywood history, no woman had ever won an Academy Award. Only one had ever been nominated, and only a handful of American women were directing feature films at all. 
and their careers were spotty at best. Even so, I, <clears throat> I was pretty confident. I'd grown up with four older brothers, and I felt sure that I would be the exception to the rule. I felt sure that with talent and hard work, I could join the pantheon of auteur directors that I admired so much. And honestly, things worked out really well at the beginning. I quickly rose to the top of my class at UCLA. My short film, A Dry Heat, won a Spotlight Award, a Cine Golden Eagle, and was a finalist for a Student Academy Award. After five years, two more short films, and many awards later, in 1994, Francis Ford Coppola handed me my Master of Fine Arts diploma. He shook my hand, and he said, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Amazingly, I was just months away from being greenlit um, to direct my first feature film, When Saturday Comes, with a budget of $2 million. This movie was produced by the prestigious Capitol Films in London, and it starred Sean Bean, Pete Postlethwaite, and Emily Lloyd. It had a first-class cast and crew, and my director of photography had lensed films for Sidney Lynette and John Huston. My whole crew called me Gov. It was the greatest year of my life. The film screened at Cannes, it got a theatrical distribution almost everywhere in the world. I signed with the William Morris Agency in London, Los Angeles, and I was attached to direct several feature films. I would be observing on Dick Wolf shows in preparation to direct episodic television. It was 1995. I was ready to launch. Well, who could have guessed that 1995 would turn out to be the year that the number of female director hires hit its all-time peak? For the rest of my career, that number would decline and sink into stasis. I would never again work as a feature film director, as a paid feature film director. <laughs> I, would, I would finance my own feature film. I would never be given an, an episode of primetime television, and I would be dropped from my agency. Instead, I watched as my male peers became the cinematic voices of our time. I watched as men who hadn't directed features and had half of my training became wealthy and sought-after television directors. Though often frustrated, I continued writing, developing projects, doggedly trying and trying to succeed. Slowly, along with so many other women directors, I became part of a lost generation of women, female voices in American cinema. Marginalized as a group, yet isolated from each other, we blamed ourselves for our individual failures. Yet deep down, we all knew that it was our industry that was failing us. In the United States, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII, is the law that spells out our constitutional right to equal employment opportunity. We would soon discover that America's entertainment industry, Hollywood, is the worst violator of Title VII of every industry in the United States, including coal mining. <laughs> Finally, realizing that I was statistically and realistically shut out no matter what I said or what I did, I lost all fear. Statistics were not available then as they are now. We knew they were bad, but looking back, we didn't know how bad. This is what the landscape looked like. While we women graduate from film schools at 50-50 parity with men, a USC study found that only 1.9% of directors of the top grossing 100 films of 2013 and 2014 were females. 1.9 directed by women. That means 98.1 of America's top studio features were coming exclusively from the perspective of men. Another study showed that 
90% of America's broadcast television programs employed no women directors during 2011 and 2012 television season, not one. And in commercials today, the most lucrative directing category, women direct just 1%. 99% of our commercials today are directed by men. Even commercials for little girls' toys, tampons, and lingerie. They are all almost exclusively directed by men. The most glamorous uh, directing category is almost as bad. Only 4% of all feature films produced by our six major studios and three mini-majors are directed by women, 4%. And of that 4%, almost 100% of them are movie stars, pop stars, or the relatives of movie moguls. Think of these women directors, Madonna, Barbara Streisand, Jodie Foster, Katie Holmes, Angelina Jolie, Penny Marshall, Betty Thomas, the list goes on. Even Sofia Coppola and Catherine Bigelow are the relatives of movie moguls. With few exceptions in America, you have to be rich enough and powerful enough to command executives if you are a woman and you want to direct. So where did that leave me? And where does that leave the regular American women who want to direct? Where does that leave the next generation of American filmmakers, American women filmmakers? Based on the numbers, you truly cannot tell a little girl that she can realistically dream of becoming a director. If you did, you would be lying. And believe me, I know that directing is one of the most competitive professions in the world. It's hard for guys, too. As my friend, the director, Martha Coolidge, said, getting, work, getting directing work is very hard for men, but for women, it's like winning the lottery. And in the New York Times, Manola Dargas wrote that while individual men struggle in the industry, women struggle as a group. For women, it just seems hopeless. Dargas also wrote that our industry's refusal to hire more female directors is immoral, maybe illegal, and has helped create and sustain a representational ghetto for women. This is not just a moral and legal problem. It's much bigger than that. The stories and images that emerge from Hollywood help define our national ethos and contribute to the voice of our civilization. If these stories are coming nearly 100% from just men, then we are not getting an authentic picture of what our world looks like. We are getting a skewed perspective, skewed to the detriment of women. In 2011, I realized that I just had to do something about it. I had to wage war on Hollywood. There were many triggers, but the strongest was my realization that the vir virtual absence of women directors from Hollywood was tantamount to the censoring and silencing of female voices in US media, which is America's most influential global export. My need to fight back was not about me, nor about the few thousand women directors missing out on jobs. It was about my moral outrage at the suppression of the voices of half our population. I headed downtown to the LA courthouses and spent countless hours studying previous class action legal efforts. I dug up the history of the original six six female directors who had spearheaded the 1983-1985 class action lawsuit against the studios for women and minority directors. I assembled statistics and I wrote a strategy for legal action. I walked into my union, the Directors Guild of America, Women's Steering Committee, armed with statistics and determined to bring change for all women directors. What I found was a stagnant committee, women who were willing to accept the status quo or chip away at the problem incrementally. My research showed me that chipping away for 25 years had brought no change at all. I wanted action. 
So I w went to war inside my guild. I helped plan a summit for women directors, the first ever in the Directors Guild. I became an administrator on the DGA Women's Steering Committee Facebook site. I ran for office. In order to build a community, I started my own blog, Women Directors Navigating the Boys Club, for women directors to share their stories about the discrimination they had faced. I published articles exposing the corruption inside my union that was keeping women shut out. I revealed how intrinsic conflict of interest prevented the DGA diversity program from effectively advancing women. You simply cannot rely on a union run by its mostly male director members, guys who are actively seeking open assignment directing jobs to simply volunteer to give up their lion's share of the work just so women can work. It's a conflict of interest. Yet the DGA is the primary organization in Hollywood charged with enforcing Title VII. In March 2013, with four other women directors, I produced the biggest, the biggest summit for women directors in Hollywood history. 200 women DGA directors attended. Most of them were meeting each other for the first time. It was a huge success. The sense of excitement, urgency, and the collective desire for revolutionary change was palpable. But the DGA, the DGA leadership, was wary, even hostile to the event. They were so worried that they literally stole the contact list that we assembled at the event in hopes of building a community. And to this day, they have never returned it. I had been to the Department of Justice, EEOC, the previous month and had spent more than three hours talking to agents there. The EEOC is America's federal agency created to enforce equal opportunity employment. They told me that they were willing to take on individual cases of discrimination, but that they didn't think that an industry-wide legal action was likely. I had been disappointed, but I knew we needed a bigger bully. So in 2013, after the summit, I took the problem to the American Civil Liberties Union, America's watchdog organization for civil rights. I met with ACLU attorneys Melissa Goodman and Ariella McDowell. Deep in the fight for gay marriage, they took the time to listen. I gave them all my research and articles, I told them why I thought the issue was significant both nationally and globally. I shared my legal strategies with them and I introduced them to a core group of women directors who could form a class in an industry-wide class action lawsuit. In October, on October 6th, uh, 2014, Melissa Goodman contacted me. The Supreme Court had rejected requests to review lower court decisions on same-sex marriage, one crucial step away from the historic June 26, 2015 ruling in favor of gay marriage. She told me, you're next. Title VII was fought and won back in 1964. Women do not have to fight that battle again because our state and federal government agencies have a legal obligation to enforce that law. And progressive, liberal, democratic Hollywood has a legal obligation to obey that law. Over the next set seven months, the ACLU launched a multifaceted campaign of media awareness, advocacy, and research. And then, on May 12, 2015, the New York Times broke the story, publishing a 15-page letter penned by Goodman and McDowell calling on our federal government, the EEOC, and two other agencies to investigate systematic discrimination against women directors. It was an historic day. The next night, however, at the DGA's 2015 annual members meeting, Guild President Paris Barkley failed to even mention it. 
The DGA exists to represent the creative and economic rights of all its director members and their teams, including women. The ACLU letter represented the most significant recent hit the most significant effort in recent history to mitigate discrimination against the DGA's own female members. The guild leadership should have been jumping for joy, but they weren't. Why not? During Q&A, I asked the guild leadership how they intended to respond to the news. Mr. Barclay made it clear, Mr. Barclay, made it clear that the DGA would not cooperate with the ACLU's efforts. The guild leadership was angry at the ACLU because that 15-page letter had implicated them in being complicit in the problem. He invoked the words of Frederick Douglass on suffrage to suggest that equity for women directors would naturally follow that of minority males, even though history tells us that women fought for 50 more years after minority men for the right to vote. The DGA was not going to help its women members, but the war was on and news was traveling fast into the mainstream media and they were resoundingly on our side. Journalists were calling me every day for updates. When would the real action begin? On October 2nd, 2015, five months after the ACLU letter had been published, the EEOC sent me the first letter asking for me to come testify at the Department of Justice offices in downtown LA. I was stunned and truly overjoyed. I picked up the phone and called the Times to break the news. A federal investigation into Hollywood hiring practices of women directors was on. We had made history. Well, needless to say, after that, it was all over for me in the Guild. <laughs> after the summit, they had mandated bylaws that effectively silenced me on my own committee. Now, new rules prevented me and some of my sister act activists from running for elected office and I was no longer even allowed to sit in the room during subcommittee meetings unless I was invited. I had been the inaugural co-chair on the proposal subcommittee, the first ever conduit between the Women's Steering Committee and the DGA National Board, and now I couldn't even enter the room. I had been elected by all DGA women directors to be the first ever DGA women directors category rep. That position went to Paris Barclays, one of his deputized picks, and I heard that she never went to a single meeting. But good things happened too. I was signed by a literary agent to write a book about my journey, and best of all, I packed up my family and left LA. I came east <laughs> to Stonington to continue my battle outside of Hollywood in our federal government where the battle belongs. Still, the industry needs to listen. We are at a tipping point. The ACLU efforts, the EEOC investigation, the unprecedented media support for the cause of women directors promise new hope. Before leaving town in The Hollywood Reporter, I called for executives and showrunners who bemoan the slippery slope of having our federal government intervene in our creative industry to question their reasoning. Title VII does not demand government oversight of who one hires. It merely ensures a level playing field upon which men and women can compete equally. Producers, networks, and studios have a legal and moral obligation to do the footwork to seek out excellence among women as well as men. Because of Hollywood's long-standing discrimination against women, producers have a deep, rich pool of working male directors to hire from, but a meager and shallow pool of working women. Our industry needs to bring back the lost generation of gifted women directors who have been disappeared 
through gender bias, thousands of women with exceptional reels and excellent credits remain unemployed and therefore invisible. These careers must be excavated and returned to the workforce. Hollywood reporters, Hollywood producers must actively seek new incoming women with the skill and talent to compete equally with the best and brightest men. The current federal investigation is not the harbinger of imposed socialism, but rather an opening of floodgates to a great wave of new and hidden talent and vision. History has repeatedly demonstrated the success of equality and courage even enforced by government action. Thanks to Title IX, America has achieved 50-50 participation of men and women in education and in sports to the economic and cultural advantage of all. Surprising innovations and excellence in 20th century arts, sciences, technologies, and athletics have flourished thanks to the inclusion of women and diverse populations. In the last 50 years, our government has made four efforts to balance the playing field in Hollywood. The last three failed. This time, we must not let such an extraordinary opportunity slip by. This is not a fight about jobs. This is a fight about how our stories are told. This is a fight about the perspective from which our universal stories emerge. Stories that affect the way we see ourselves and how we are seen by others around the world. If these stories, stories that ultimately belong to all of us, are coming from only a male perspective, we are building a world that is skewed and lacking authenticity. This empowers one half the population and leaves the other disadvantaged. This produces an unfair division of humanity cleaved by gender. Today, our government, our media, and our people are unified in the belief that the exclusion of women from the voice of our national ethos, from the very voice of our civilization, is unacceptable. This is something worth fighting for, and I don't regret being the troublemaker who started the fight. What I will regret is if inertia, inaction, and entrenched unconscious bias sabotage the change that is now so close at hand. I truly hope and pray that we all get on the right side of history and create this essential change our society so desperately needs now more than ever. Thank you. so, so much. I would love to just open it up to any and all questions you might have. Um, the Q&A part is easier for me than the speeching. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I think I know the answer. My question is, what is the feedback from actors and actresses if you guys endeavor to get into the forefront and start directing? Yeah, it's, that's a really good question. Um, so there has been, you know, a lot of support coming from uh, male and female actors. Uh, and I think that the work that we have done has encouraged everybody in every aspect of, of our industry. We have some really great, powerful male voices um, that are stepping up to the plate and some really wonderful uh, women actors who have been speaking out. But the one thing that no one will do, or almost no one will do, is talk about the EEOC investigation, which is by far the most important thing that is going on in terms of uh, creating gender equity for all of us, because it has to happen. It has to happen through legislative change. It has to come through legal action. But for anybody in our industry who wants a job, it's a conflict of interest for them to talk about uh, the, the EEOC investigation. For example, one of our greatest fighters, who's a 
fantastic actor, Gina Davis, and she's at the forefront of gender equity. Even when she's asked about the EEOC investigation, she will say, well, that's not really my area of expertise, but what I can speak to is, and all the other wonderful things she's doing, which are wonderful, but if you're supporting the EEOC investigation and encouraging that to develop into the necessary legal action that we all need so much, then you're saying that our federal government needs to sue the studios, and that's not going to get anybody a job. So, is it, would you say there's maybe a fear of being blacklisted? Is that the case? Oh, that yeah, kind of. <laughs> right, that's, that's the answer I do. Nail on head, yes. <laughs> Yeah, great question. So the most current status is really exciting news, um, and that is uh, that as of uh, May 12th, 2016, just a couple of months ago, um, the ACLU uh, broke the news to the LA Times that the EEOC investigation is ramping it up. So um, they had spent the first uh, October, November, December, January, May, seven months um, interviewing women directors and uh, trying to get a very clear uh, picture of the store of, of what the whole landscape looked like and what the problem was and now they're um, asking executives showrunners guild leaders agency heads to come forward and speak out if they don't speak out the EEOC has the right to subpoena them Yeah, so the ultimate um, result, I think, would be uh, a class action legal case, a lawsuit um, that would be industry-wide and that would, for, that would move up to the Supreme Court and force a kind of ruling that would demand uh, some ratio of gender equity, preferably 50-50. Okay, and did you follow the class action lawsuit of the writers' age discrimination? Yes, I did. I did, and and um, that was a fascinating case, um, and ultimately didn't really result in, in much. So we hope that this will be much more effective. Sorry. No, you. Oh, yes. I wonder if um, the PGA or the Writers Guild, any committees or groups there, have reached out to you in support or looking to work together or anything, or has it just sort of been silent from the other unions as well? Um, ind individuals from uh, the Writers Guild and the Producers Guild have come forward and asked if they could work with me toward doing similar things as what I did in the Directors Guild. But the, the, the guilds themselves, the organizations themselves, have, have done absolutely nothing. And I loved your speech. Thank you. Um, I don't know what we can do. I personally have not been a great fan of Hollywood movies. As an example, I just saw the first Star Wars for the first time a few days ago. So I have voted with my feet, not going to most of the movies that are produced, um, going to women's movies when I can. But I've noticed that even the directors, and we probably uh, gave a good reason indirectly why, a lot of movies really are not that, they don't really speak to women in a fresh way, um, they are in a way co-opted. And how do we get, you know, we'll go, go beyond that because yes, a lot of, many of the producers are women, but they're not supporting fresh visions. A lot of the women are ghettoized in uh, small, low budget movies that aren't really distributed. What can we do? as the audience. Yeah. The holy dollar is what counts. Yeah. Yeah. It's such good observations and, and keying into exactly the kind of passion that so many of us are have been feeling. You know, what what can we do? You know, we, we, we can't know what women's stories are, are gonna look like because women have never really had the opportunity to be the storytellers. And even when they are, they're being financed and greenlit by male executives and they are 
getting their budgets created by male executives and they are, uh, their final product is, succumbs to male critics. I think 80% of our critics are male. And, um, and the distributors, of course, you know, how the film is going to be distributed. So um, we really have to create gender equity and have it for some long period of time. Um, in order for us to be able to really see what female stories are, are going to look like. Um, yeah, there's a lot of grassroots grassroot movements to, um, to try to get women to um, you know, boycott uh, movies that are totally misogynistic and sexist. Um, and um, there, there are many, many things that are going on that are kind of exciting in that way. But I would say that the most important thing that we need to do is to create legislative change. Now, I've been examining why it is that Title IX was successful and why we, it's, we really do have gender equity in our, in our in education and, and sports here in the United States, but why Title VII has been so um, ineffective. And when you really look at it, what you see is that since 1964, Title IX has been jiggered and <laughs> updated and amended, and it's been worked on, and it's been, it's been made to work. But I think that because of we have a, a free market capitalism, that in some way equal employment opportunity is, um, is anathema to, to that. You know, the people who own the means of production want to control all their decisions and so equal employment opportunity is a tough one so we need to amend that so in order to we need to start working on title 7 to make it enforceable in hollywood so that we can get equal gender equal storytelling and begin to hear women's voices so i would say the most important thing you could do is vote for hillary <laughs> Yeah, you and, and then you. Shira. Pardon? You're a Shira. My Angela will coin the word Shira, which is what I hate. What does that mean? Yeah, my Angela is a Shira. Oh, a Shira. Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you. That's very sweet. Meryl to Meryl Streep is one of the all-time great yeah. women actors in all history um, and a great voice for women. Yes. Um, and once again, she has will not, as will as nobody will, <laughs> will talk about uh, the need for legal action, legislative change. Um, she's doing a lot of things to get um, women, especially women over 40, writing screenplays, and so she's been sponsoring, uh, uh, I don't want to say it's they're not fellowships, but, you know, um, workshops, workshops. <laughs> um, uh, for, to support that kind of thing. And she's speaking out, and, and she's a, just an incredibly valuable, important voice, so we're, we're grateful. Um, pardon me. It seems that the EEOC investigation is, is crucial to the success of this movement. Do you have a timeline for when you might expect? No, that's what all the journalists ask me, and it's a good question. Um, well, let's see. You know, there have been three other EEOC efforts that could have affected female hires and uh, director hires in Hollywood, one in the 1960s, one in the 1970s, and one in the 1980s. And they all took several years and resulted in uh, many pages of uh, reports. The 1978 report was 55 pages long, and it pointed out the clear and appalling discrimination against women and ethnic minorities. Um, and then nothing happened, nothing at all. So the EEOC will have been at this uh, for a year, and I would expect that it would take at least another year for them to continue uh, to, it, to be speaking to executives in Hollywood and trying to figure out um, what kind of strategy they can take. 
and then I would guess it would be a couple of years to put together a class action lawsuit, or maybe they just want to find other ways to remediate the problem through working with executives, which I don't think is <laughs> gonna result in anything. Um, so I would say all in all, at least five years from a year ago, so four years. Um, but once again, you know, we, we need to find the trigger to make this effective. You know, the EEOC is a, you know, a huge behemoth, slow-moving organization, and they always, they like to do things uh, the way they've done them before, and they're not really dyna dynamic, innovative thinkers. And so, I mean, there are great organizations, and there are many, many great civil servants working there and doing their best, and I've met many of them, and they're very, very intelligent and excellent. But in order for us to go from the investigation to success, um, you know, we have to, somebody has to figure out what the, what the trigger is. And right now, I, I'm uh, working, I'm consulting with a Washington, D.C. law firm um, who's investigating the possibility of doing a private class action lawsuit for women directors that could parallel what the EEOC is doing. And we have some really, really exciting ideas about how we can make that effective. And one of those things is to get the 2011 Walmart Supreme Court ruling. Uh, the Supreme Court ru ruled in favor of Walmart in 2011 in a class action lawsuit with a million five hundred women who were claiming um, pay inequity. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Walmart. Um, and in doing so, they set the precedent that you can't use. Um, you can't use statistical evidence as a primary form of evidence in a class action discrimination case. And so this was really one of the biggest reasons that the EEOC didn't think they could help me back in 2013 when I met with them. And also one of the reasons the EEOC was reluctant. Um, and so this law firm is interested in finding the perfect storm case that could overturn that terrible loss. And, and, and so we're really excited about perhaps some parallel action here. So you think that's the best way to initiate the next step? To my mind, uh, you know, some people believe that incremental change and cooperation from, you know, executives in Hollywood is the way to do it. In, in my mind, uh, and I think we have a great deal of historical evidence to, to demonstrate it, the only thing that's going to make change is is legal action, is, is a lawsuit. You know, it's interesting, in 1980, I was talking about the original six, six great women who um, are really good friends of mine, and one in particular who helped me incredibly in the past five years. Um, they got the DGA to launch a class action lawsuit in 2000, I mean in, in 1983, and in 1985, Judge Pamela Reimer, uh, who was a Ninth Circuit Court California judge appointed by Ronald Reagan, um, ruled, she didn't rule in favor of the studios, this was a DGA, a DGA led class action lawsuit for women and ethnic minority directors, and um, against the studios. And Judge Pamela Reimer ruled that even though this was a really important lawsuit, a viable lawsuit, and it should be continued, that the DGA could not lead the class. So she disqualified them from leading the class because she said that for them it was a conflict of interest as they were an agency, a union, rather, a union run by their mostly male directors who are actively seeking open assignment jobs. So, um, so she took the DGA uh, you know, out, out, of, out of there. Even so, from 1985 when she made that ruling until 1995, the number of women directors skyrocketed from one half of 1% to 16% in just 10 years. So we see that legal action can be very effective and we see that when we drop the ball and stop thinking about it, um, that the numbers fall into stasis and decline. I hope I answered your question. 
and you, 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 uh, pardon me. Uh, yes, please. You, you have just asked the really, you know, such an important question. Um, so, you know, since the DGA was disqualified back in 1985 from being, I mean, she really did suggest that the DGA was in a conflict of interest in enforcing Title VII, yet even in so, from henceforward, going forward, you know, the DGA has been the primary organization that enforces Title VII, and there's been nobody else kind of looking over the shoulders. So we have a very exciting idea of what, you know, we have um, distributors. Like, when we talk about, uh, about how to solve this problem or about a lawsuit, a class action lawsuit, we usually talk about well, we've got to go after the producers who do the hiring because they're the ones who are hiring, you know, hiring, they're the ones we have to get to. But what if we didn't do that? What if we went to the distributors instead? The, distri the distributors in Hollywood are the choke point of the industry. You can make all the content you want, but if, you, if it doesn't abide by our federal laws, like Title VII, or so that, that, that the distributors can't distribute that content, the FCC, for example, has all kinds of rules and regulations that they have to enforce on the on the producers and um, on the distributors, actually. And then the, so the distributors have to enforce those on the producers. They have all kinds of child labor, you know, this a great laundry list of laws. And so, why why can't we add gender equal hiring to that? laundry list of, of, of laws that need to be enforced. I mean, the FCC just does that for broadcast television, but of course, a lot of feature films end up being broadcast on television, but we really need to find a way to enforce that also in feature films and indie features and commercials. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that we, we have to take this out of out of Hollywood to a certain extent in order to create changes and amendments to Title VII so it's enforceable in Hollywood. But at a certain point, we could, we could force Hollywood to enforce those laws themselves by having federal laws and, and, and in, imposing the, the enforcement of them on the distributors, yeah, as we already do now. That is, that's exactly right. So it almost seems easy, you know, it almost seems like we could solve this problem. You know, if we can just take this out of Hollywood and get, get it into our, our federal government and get legislative change made and get those amendments made to Title VII, we could make these. You know, here's the fascinating thing is that since that ACLU letter got published in the New York Times in 2015, all these other countries around the world have made, been making sweeping initiatives for gender equal hiring mandates in, in their entertainment industries. Uh, you have the UK, Ireland, uh, Norway, Sweden, Croatia, Canada, um, did I say New Zealand, Australia? Uh, there are all these countries that are being you know, very, very progressive, and of course, they have a lot more, uh, you, you know, socialism in their, you know, less free market capitalism and more socialism. So it's easier for them. And also, you know, what what another thing that they have is that their their entertainment industries, you know, get a lot of public funding. And so they are even, you know, more have their arms tied behind their backs in terms of having to abide by their nation's civil rights, uh, employment, and hiring laws. 
but you know the United States also, you know Hollywood, the, the United States entertainment industry has to abide by our laws too, and we just have to make them more binding. Yes. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Documentaries is um, the well, and this really will give you a very clear picture of what the problem is. Uh, about thirty-nine percent, I think. It, I think it's around forty percent of uh, featured documentaries are directed by women. Um, what you find in the industry is that if you don't get paid. They don't mind if women do it, so, <laughs> and that's real, you know, really, you know, the way it is. So, you know, documentaries is the the, the least glamorous, least lucrative, and um, so they they let women do that work. Do you feel safe in Stonington? <laughs> <laughs> Did you see Paris Barkley and Jay Roth up there? <laughs> <laughs> they have their soldiers everywhere. <laughs> no, and you know, it was, you know, it, it, it got stressful, you know. My husband and kids could tell you, you know, my, some of my women director friends wouldn't talk to me on the phone because they thought my phone was tapped. And, um, you know, you know, they definitely, um, they, they threatened to me, you know. They, they said, you know, if the DGA has a blacklist, Maria Geis is on it. And they said to me in a women's steering committee meeting, if you play hard, you can bet we're going to play a lot harder. And, um, you know, they weren't messing around. You know, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, threatening the livelihood. Like the head of the Director's Guild, Jay Roth, said, you know, if, if, you, if you really want to take this on, you better know that you're, you're going to be fighting a war because you're talking about taking the food off the tables of men. And that really is, you know, how they how they saw it. You know, as if women don't have any tables. The star was on the rise. And what happened? What was the precipitating incident that happened? That oh, your agency dropped you, and all these things happened that were so. Yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I shouldn't have left England, you know, I should have stayed in England. You know, I had been working in Norway and France and England. I wasn't facing the kind of discrimination there that I faced when I left, when I, I finished my feature film and came back. But, you know, I told my, my agent at William Morris in Los Angeles that I, I wanted to direct episodic television. And he said, he went to the um, the, he was in the feature film depart department, the motion picture department of William Morris, and so he went to the episodic TV department and asked if they would rep me too. And as soon as they heard I was a woman, they were not interested. And I observed hundreds and hundreds of hours on Dick Wolf shows, on Law and Order, on Crime and Punishment, and on um, LA Law. And um, uh, after I, after I finished my feature, I asked the executive producer, um, Ed Sharon, of uh, the executive producer of, of uh, Law and Order, no, <laughs> of LA, yes, of Law and Order, if he would give me an episode. And I had already, I'd already observed for many hundreds of hours on the other two shows, on Crime and Punishment in LA Law in LA, and he was exec producing Law and Order in, um, in New York. And he said, you've done your magic again, Maria. I love your feature. Um, yes, I'll give you an episode. And so he told me I had to come out and observe. So I went out to New York and I observed. And there was this incredibly misogynistic jerk of a DP who was this Greek guy called Constantine Macris. And he was so hostile. He was so, like, did not want me on that set at all. And, um, he had directed one episode, I think, when I was observing on that show. But anyway, um, after I finished observing, I went back to Los Angeles and um, asked Ed when I was going to get my episode, and he said he couldn't give me one. And then in uh, April, when I was supposed to have got my episode, he ended up giving it to his um, stepson. Jay Alexander's son, Jace Alexander, 
who got nailed for child pornography <laughs> a year ago. So they should have hired me. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, um, Constantine Macris ended up directing 156 episodes um, of the almost 400 episodes they shot going forward. So, you know, it's cutthroat, it's competitive, and um, it's, it's totally sexist. And I think maybe 35 of those almost 400 episodes were directed by women. So they really, and, and it was one, almost one woman who directed those. So they, you know, it's, it's, it's sex discrimination, it's just bias, you know, they're, and it wasn't just me, you know, they're, they're not, you know, it's all my friends, none of us were getting any work. So. I have two questions. One is, were you involved with the satirical video, I think it's called Make It, Make it Fair, is that, um, it's, uh, and I'm wondering if you can laugh at it or not, but it's about not, you know, women not stepping down until it's 100% men in Hollywood. It's, uh, it's very, oh, oh, that's great. Oh, there have been some hilarious um, yeah. satires. Yeah, a friend of mine did an article about um, a secret enclave of women directors found on a small deserted island in the ocean somewhere trying to make their films. Um, yeah, there's been some good comedy that's come out of it. Uh, my second question is, I found last week uh, with the nomination of Hillary the president, I was reflecting on so many times in my life where I had been silenced or held back. And I wasn't prepared for that, and I wonder what your thoughts were on that historically. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's incredible. We look at all of the different professions throughout the ages, throughout many civilizations, and you find that women and women's stories are disappeared. And it continues on today. You know, I think that for the health of our civilization, we need to change that once and for all. And um, there are some great women um, artists and uh, writers and musicians and poets um, that have remained in alive <laughs> through history, but very, very few. And but when you start looking back digging into history, you see that they're there. They just got disappeared. And um, that is uh, cross-culture throughout, throughout the ages. And um, we can really do something about that. There's a great new play that came out of Wellesley College. Good night, Jessamoa, good morning, Juliet. Oh, yes. I have heard, I have heard of it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, should we take a, one more question and we'll, or two? I'll we'll have a, two more questions and some wine. I just want to make sure. I will for the way. Are you sure that she's supportive of women directors? No. No, I, I actually um, uh, feel that, um, you know, you know, I've been writing to, to, to um, you know, our leaders about this issue, and I haven't heard much response. Um, you know, what I'm hoping is that it's been under the radar. Um, what I'm hoping is that is um, that we're, we're we're going to hear more. But um, I, 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 I fear for the alternative. I truly do. Is there any outlet, such as HBO or something independent and small, in which women directors might have a better chance because I, that's something that I really would like to do? Yeah, well, it, it's a really good question. Um, it's also one of the problems, you know, it's always, um, let's, what if we do something small, you know, let's, let's make a little production company for women, and then there's no money, and, um, you know, I think that that whatever we do, and, and there are different things that are, you know, pr producers are coming up now, it's even fashionable. You know, we do it together and um, uh, Game Changer, um, there are a bunch of different production companies that are all for female directed films, not even necessarily female themed, just women director uh, created projects. Um, 
So that's great, but for me, my fight has to be in legislature. My, my fight has to be the legal battle. Uh, otherwise, it's incremental. And, and even if you make the movies, you know, even if you make these little films with a tiny little budget, you don't get distributed. They don't get seen. They rarely do. Sometimes one emerges, but you know, it's not the way to do it. You know, we need to fight this fight for all women. We need to, to create collective change for all women, for a once and for all change. And, and, and not set, keep sitting back and saying, oh, well, we'll just do these little things. We'll do these little docs. We'll take the second-rate stuff. You know, we'll take the bad TV shows. You know, that, the time to, that, enough is enough. I think. <laughs> Thank you.